Uh, any questions from yesterday's class? Okay. Uh, so uh, we were discussing channel length modulation, and the conclusion that we arrived was our firstly our transistor when biased in saturation, its incremental module got slightly modified, and the modification was as follows. The only modification was there was a parasitic and uh, drain to source resistance connected between the drain and the source terminals. And the value of this resistance, the incremental resistance was one over lambda IDS, where IDS was the Weissen current flowing, flowing through the transistor. Okay. And then uh, also we saw that uh, our gain, the intrinsic gain, that is GM over GDS of the transistor was essentially proportional to one by uh, lambda under root IDS. And this essentially was the maximum possible gain that you can get out of a transistor because the moment you uh, you load the transistor with another external resistor, so that resistor will come in parallel with RDS and it will reduce the gain. So in an, this is essentially the maximum gain that you can get out of a real common source amplifier if uh, you load the common source amplifier with a infinite possible resistor. I mean, assuming the biases and all are, are satisfied. And we also saw that the lambda was inversely proportional to one over L, or inversely proportional to L. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if we have to increase, if we have to increase the gain, that is we have to reduce GDS, which means we have to reduce lambda, which means we saw that we have to decrease, we have to increase the, uh, the length of the transistor. Now, increasing the length of the transistor has direct implications on the current on the GM of the transistor. And if we want to keep them same, we know that, that they are related to W over L, the ratio of W and L, which means that uh, you'll have to correspondingly increase, increase W. And then we, we saw that in, in this particular example now our gain v naught over vi happens to be minus gm times rds parallel rl in the absence of rds it was only minus gm parallel rl but now we know that uh, we cannot really neglect rds Un until and unless RDS is much greater than RL. Okay, so in so which essentially means that if you are a designer and you have to design uh, uh, a common source amplifier for a certain amount of gain, you'll have to keep in mind how the RDS varies, right? So you cannot just simply say that I just bias the transistor uh, in saturation and I will adjust VDD and keep RDS to be very high. Uh, as it turns out, <laughs> if you have to if you have to do that, you'll have to ensure that for under all those conditions, RDS is much greater than RL. Otherwise, you'll be limited by RL. Otherwise, the gain will be limited by RL. And then, uh, and then we saw that if we have to, uh, what are the design variables that we have in order to uh, increase RDS? Essentially, we'll have to reduce L. Uh, sorry, you have to increase L. And if you want to keep GM to be the same, you have to increase both W and L. And the direct consequence of that is increase in the size of the transistor. Okay, that is one of the one of the direct consequences of increasing size of the transistor. And in an integrated circuit, size matters. Size matters most, which means that becomes expensive solution. Not only that, I haven't yet touched upon another very important aspect uh, of circuit design, and that is the effect of capacitances. Right. So you know that your MOSFET is at its core; it has a capacitance, right? It's metal oxide semiconductor. There is a capacitance, and that capacitance is between your gate and source, gate and drain, gate and volume, and so on. 
So if you increase the size of the transistor, these capacitances will also increase and they will have more implications. We'll get to that in a couple of classes, but for that, for, for today's class, you don't have to bother, but keep it in mind that increasing the size of the transistor has multiple effects. It's not only that the area increases, it also increases the capacitance. And if you if the capacitance increases naturally, you'll have some uh, effect on the on the uh, frequency response of the of the circuit. Okay, so we'll get to that. I, I'm sure you are learning about uh, Nyquist clause, Bode plots in E250. So we will leverage those learnings uh, in a couple of classes. Okay, uh, so now uh, let's assume that this increasing the size of the transistor just to get gain is is, is not particularly a very good design in the sense that okay you can get a lot of gain by doing that but it increases the size it, it deteriorates the frequency response and let's assume that is not something that you would like we would like to avoid okay so the uh, the next few minutes we'll try to see what are the possible solutions in order to avoid increasing the size of the transistor in order to get more gain okay so uh, so what is the issue now the issue is In the incremental sense, in the incremental sense, my transistor now is this. The problem that we are facing is when we are taking this voltage R V naught across RL, we are not only taking it across RL, it's essentially across the parallel combination of RL and RDS. In other words, in other words, whatever incremental current that is flowing out is getting divided between RL and RDS. Okay, that's causing the drop in gain. So if we have, if we want to prevent that drop in gain, Natural thing to do is to prevent this current division, right? We have to prevent this current division in order, and we want all of GMVI to flow into RL. Okay, so which means that directly connecting RL to RDS is not something that you can do. That that part is uh, kind of obvious, which means that I'll have to insert something here. Let me redraw this part. Which means I have to insert something here, right? So to insert something here so that all the current flows into that box. You know, so, yeah. So the issue was the current that was coming from GMVI from the source, it was getting divided between RDS and RL. And if we want to prevent that from happening, what I'm proposing is let's insert something in between so that all the current flows in to this box and comes out through this side and nothing goes into RDS or minuscule fraction of that goes into RDS. Okay. So if I have to do that, what characteristics of this box am I looking for in terms of impedances? Very low impedance, right? You should have very low input impedance. And when it comes out from the other side, uh, what in terms of impedance can you tell me? So let's assume this is the input port. This is the output port of this box. From the input side, I would want very low impedance, ideally zero impedance, right? If I have zero impedance looking up, if we, if we want this impedance, let's say R in, to be almost equal to zero, then all of GMVI will flow into that box. Now, naturally, <clears throat> whenever you make it realize Anything uh, with real elements, your R in will not be equal to zero. It will be some non-zero value, which means that you have to get something where R in is much, much lesser than RDS. This is probably designed, this is possibly that you can design. You cannot design R in to be equal to zero, but you can 
design are in to be much less than certain value. And similarly, when the current comes out from the other side, we'll also have to be cognizant of the fact that this R, there is an R out of this box. It's not in series, it's in parallel with RL. Yeah, you can tell me. Right? So, so if I just concentrate on this part, So what is happening? You have GM V in or minus GM V in flowing up and you have R in here and you have RDS here. So R in has to be independent of RL, otherwise you have a problem. You don't know that. I have not put an explicit register of RDM. So including RL, the looping in impedance has to be much lesser than, yeah, so, correct. Looking from the point, looking up, it has to be much lesser. So you have to put a contraption there, which does this job, okay? Otherwise, there's no point. If, otherwise, if I just put a R, R in series, then obviously it will be more than RL, right? RL plus R. So we are essentially making the problem worse. Okay, let's uh, concentrate on this part. For, for uh, I mean, instead of going into the R out part, I'll go to the R out part uh, in a couple of minutes. So let's concentrate on the R in part. So uh, among all the circuits that we have done till now, uh, can you recall a contraption? whose input impedance is very small. In other words, here, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a current buffer. Right? I want all the current to go in, into that box. I don't want any current diversion to, to, to happen. I want all the current to go in, into the box and come out from the other side. That is equivalent to saying I want a current buffer. Right? And even if you don't recall that term, can you think of a topology which gives me a very low input impedance regardless of whatever it is driving? You have only one single transistor circuits mostly, so. Right, yeah. Yeah, so if you look into the source of a transistor, the, the, if the transistor is properly biased in saturation, and if you look into the source, the impedance is 1 over GM, right? So it seems like if I connect a transistor such that the source is connected to that point, that should do our job, right? So okay, if you don't recall, so what if I assume the transistor is biased in saturation, and you have RL here. And I have connected a V test voltage here. Okay. What is the input impedance? If I neglect RDS, let's neglect RDS for the time being. What will be the input impedance? You can put pen to paper and tell me. One over zoom, right? So increment incrementally, yeah, this pushes here out GM times V test current. This is essentially the I test. So your input impedance is one over GM. And this is independent of RL or dependent on RL? This is independent of RL. And if I can make one over GM much more smaller than something, then I can essentially get a contraption which is independent of whatever the load is. Correct? However, do you know that? I mean, this. We have been neglecting RDS all along, but now we know that we cannot do that, right? Because uh, RDS is a reality of a transistor. 
So in the presence of RDS, how does the input impedance get affected? So let's assume you have RL here. And I apply a test voltage. And I'm trying to find out I test. Okay. So what will be the input impedance? How will you go about uh, solving this? This will be GM times D test looking up. So can you calculate this and tell me what will uh, what will I test be in terms of V test? So your I test will be, or let me just write down the full thing. E test by I test will be RL plus RDS and one plus GMRDS. And recall that in, I think in tutorial two, you, I had asked you to solve some incremental uh, gain and uh, impedances. We should be able to relate those circuits with this, these type of circuits, right? So, so if you don't relate, go back to tutorial two and, uh, and look at them again. So uh, this essentially is your uh, is your input impedance looking looking into the source. Now a quick sanity check: if RDS tends to infinity, right? If RDS tends to infinity, this tends to this expression tends to one over GM, and that is what we expect. If R, in the absence of RDS, that is RDS tends to infinity, the looking in impedance would be one over GM. If RDS goes to zero. In the looping yeah. impedance should be RL because you are directly seeing RL. And that's what this expression also are telling us, right? Fine. So now, uh, if you have to make this independent of RL, right? If we have, this is, the, this, this is what you will get in the presence of RDS. But if you have to make this independent of RL, what do you need to target? Yes, and uh, maximum RDS in, in terms of in terms of RL, you have to target RDS to be much greater than RL. Right? You have to target RDS to be much greater than RL. Let's uh, uh, assume you 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 are able to do that. Uh, if RDS is much greater than RL, right? Then my V test in RN is approximately equal to one over G. And this is something that is, is a designer controllable variable. And I can set the value of GM to whatever I need by changing the WNL. And even if you are not able to set RDS to be much greater than RL, right? Let's say RDS is exactly equal to RL, right? So if RDS is equal to RL, what is the looking in impedance? is two RDS by one plus GMRDS. And GMRDS is always greater than one, right? Because the intrinsic gain of the transistor has to be greater than one. Otherwise, there's no point of designing with this contraption. So this is approximately equal to two over GM then, right? It's not so bad. It's still not so bad. It's still, a, it's still in, in your control. So you can still get away with using and these type of uh, approximations. Okay, so now uh, if you are convinced that this this is a this is a circuit that we can that, that can give us an input impedance which is much lower than RL, right? Even if I am uh, looking in one, into one of its terminals, which essentially means that I probably can stick in that contraption here, right? In the in, uh, in the green box. So if we do that, what happens? So in the incremental sense, if we do that, so this, this was my original <laughs> 
circuit and I am putting in that extra contraption. Let me sketch it with a different color. Look up this GM2. This is DS2. This is RL. So now this looking in impedance is approximately equal to one over GM2, provided you have made uh, uh, your RDS2 more than RL, or uh, let me just keep it in terms of RL. So we'll, we'll, we'll replace RL later, right? So if RL if is much lesser than RDS1, which mind you now Arden is in your control. If you can do that, what fraction of GM1 will go inside? Okay, in terms of Arden, if I even if I don't do this, what will be what will be the current that will be flowing in if this is Arden? It will be minus GM times VI times RDS1 by Arden plus. RDS1, right? You are having current division proportional to the ratio of the of the impedances, okay? And when this current flows in, it has no other option but to come out from the other side, right? So this current will come out from the other side, and it will develop a voltage across RL, correct? Right? And this voltage that you will develop will be minus gm times rds1 by rn that's rds1 times rl times vi i think i lost vi somewhere times vi okay and if you now if you ensure that if rn is much lesser than rds1 then v naught becomes approximately equal to minus gm times rl times p okay see i don't i didn't have to do anything to gm gm1 right in this case of the gm1 okay i didn't have to increase the size of gm1 all i had to do is to put a contraption such that the input impedance of the contraction is much lesser than the output impedance of GM1. Okay, so by doing that, so essentially I put in a current buffer so that whatever current is I am getting from the GM1 should go directly into that contraction and not into, into RDS1. So once the current goes into that RDS1, it has to come out from the other side, right? Assuming there is no other leakage paths anywhere, right? Uh, so whatever goes in has to come out from the other side. Once it comes out from the other side, it goes into RL and you get GM1 times RL, which is essentially the classic common source amplifier voltage gain. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? So now, uh, this is as far as the incremental part of it is concerned. If uh, now I have to replace that that transistor with a, I mean that uh, control source with a transistor, and I think we have done this circuit in different contexts multiple times. So we have to insert our M two transistor in between, right? So the first thing obviously is to place that M2. And you have RL here, this VDD. So what will you do to the gate? I have to keep M2 in saturation, right? All the calculations that I did is assuming M2 is in, is control source is in saturation. 
so what will you do to the gate you have to connect a dc voltage right you have to connect a dc voltage let's say vb2 so this is vb1 okay so if this now i mean you have done multiple assignments on this and how to keep this contraption in in saturation right you have to adjust the value of vb2 in such a way that m1 doesn't really get crushed right you have to vb2 cannot be very low if vb2 becomes very low then m1 can go out, go into triode vb2 cannot be very high if it goes very high then m2 can go into linear so you have to find out that range of vb2 and and uh, and apply appropriate voltage uh, note that you have done uh, we had covered one circuit which was kind of a source follower where we had applied the input here and we had observed it here right the same circuit where i have applied the input at a different location now right but with the with the hope of all the incremental current that flows out of m1 gets into rl and not into rds1 okay fine okay so now tell me uh, if i have to stay on this circuit for a bit more for longer time so tell me what will be the output impedance that is looking down from top what will be r out of this incremental output impedance you calculate it anybody else got it Should do it because it's a practice for squeezes and incense, right? Yeah, so this R out will be RDS one plus RDS two plus GM two times RDS one RDS two. Okay, uh, this is a vitally important expression, and I recommend that you buy it. Uh, so the important thing about this expression is there are three terms. Obviously, the RDS one plus RDS two is something that we definitely expect because we have put one RDS two on top of RDS one. The impedance should at least have RDS one plus RDS two. But what about this other term? And can you comment on the magnitude of these terms? Which one is the dominant one among these three? And assume GM times RDS is more than one, right? You can always assume that in saturation. Third one, right? So clearly, RDS one and RDS two will be of similar order, right? They are having same currents, same bias currents. So one cannot be very different from the other. I mean, one can always argue that lengths are different, but the whole purpose of doing this thing is to ensure that we don't want two different lengths, right? We don't want very large transistors, which means that RDS one will be approximately equal to RDS two, which means that the third term clearly will be the dominant one, right? So if GM times R for any transistor is greater than one, then R out is approximately equal to GM2 times RDS1 times RDS2. The way I like to write it is GM2 times RDS2 times RDS1, where GM2 times RDS2 is the intrinsic gain of M2, right? So this is, I can say that this is AV of two, is the intrinsic gain of M2. So the gate, the effectively the 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 gain the resistance of RDS one got multiplied by the gain of the voltage gain of M two. Okay, so if you had directly connected RL like a common source amplifier in the absence of M two, so the issue would have been the impedance looking into M one would have been RDS one, right? In the absence of M two. The the R, RL was getting loaded with RDS one. However, when you put this contraction in between, 
the R out has increased from RDS1 to RDS1 times the gain of M2. So your RL is now getting loaded with R, not RDS1, but RDS1 times the gain of M2. Okay, so which essentially that is the reason why almost all the current of M1 is flowing into RL, right? So this is obviously much greater than RDS1, right? So essentially you have you have found out a way of increasing the impedance of a of a network looking in from one side, and you have found out a way of reducing the impedance of a network looking in from some other terminal. Okay, so these kind of things are, I mean, in different parlance are often called impedance transformers, right? So you can, you put something in between and uh, you essentially modify the impedance that your network is seeing. Okay, this particular structure, this particular structure is called cascode transistor, right? So when you put a, uh, when you put a, a transistor in, in between M1 and this load in the, in the way that we have shown here, this track, uh, this transistor is often called a cascode configuration. Okay, not to be confused with cascade. Cascade is when you put one after another. Here they are sharing the same current. In a cascade, it, cascade means you have two different stages. We'll come to that in a few class, but few classes. But cascade is something that you hear a lot uh, in different contexts. Cascode is particular to to circuit design. Okay. Any questions? In R out, GM1 has no role to play. And why does it make sense? Why does GM1 doesn't have any role? Yeah, so essentially when you're trying to figure out R out, you are desensitizing the input, right? You are shorting VI. When you are shorting VI, GM1 goes, right? GM1 is not, not there anymore when you are trying to figure out the output difference. However, GM2 is there because this node will move. Because the source is moving of M2, GM2 comes into picture. Nothing. Neither the gate nor the source is moving. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, so, uh, in last class, we had talked about we brought in this RDS, right? So by the way, I mean, if when we if we had neglected RDS uh, that we were doing for most of the course, what would have been the output impedance? If RDS was infinity. It's infinite, right? So in, in, in the absence of RDS, the role of Casco transistor is not even valued, right? So the, this, this Casco transistor came into being because M1 was not giving you infinite RDS, okay? So in the presence of a non-ideality of, of M1, we had to put in some extra contraption, which makes it a better transistor, right? If you can, you can think of this entire stuff as a single transistor, we, where you have one input and you have some output, but that output is output resistance is now GM2 times RDS2 times RDS1. Okay, so to somebody who doesn't know what is inside the box, and if you tell somebody that this is a cascode, this is a common source amplifier, and you cannot see inside the box, what would it look like? It would look like I have a transistor which has a GM of whatever GM1 and output impedance equal to GM2 times RDS2 times RDS1. Okay, and if you don't know much, what will you conclude? You will conclude that a very good transistor whose RDS is very high, which means that probably it's mimicking a transistor of a very large LNG, right? So if let's assume GM2 times RDS2 is a factor of 10, right? This is approximately 10, let's assume, right? Which means that I have increased the output impedance of the transistor by a factor of 10. And if you had to do that by increasing the length, you would have had to increase the length by a factor of 10 and W correspondingly also by a factor of 10 because you wouldn't have wanted to affect the GM. So, which means you would have had to increase the size of the transistor by a factor of 100. However, in this case, you don't have to do that 
you can probably put in some similar circuit of similar size and mimic a transistor which is bigger and fatter. And not only that, as you will see later on, since I have not increased the size of M1, the capacitance associated with M1 hasn't changed. Right, so this has benefits. This has frequency benefits. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a couple of classes when we will deal with uh, frequency compensation and so on. Okay, now uh, we have another 10 minutes or so. Let me introduce uh, one more non ability that, uh, that a MOSFET suffers from, and that is as follows. So till now we have assumed that the source and the body are both grounded, right? Till now we have assumed that these two are tied together and we call this this ground. But that need not necessarily be the case. For example, in this case, the body of M1 and M2 are same because they are sitting on the same substrate, right? So let's assume that this is a P-type substrate and let's say this is the M1. Okay, this is the M1 transistor and I am making an M2 transistor. So the substrate is, the com is common for all transistors that are sitting in the wafer, which means I will make another transistor here. This is gate, this is maybe this is the source, so G2, S2, D2. And I will probably connect this to that and this I will name M2. And this body and source will be grounded and I will connect some RL here. Okay, so the body is grounded in both cases, but the source is grounded in one of the transistors. Right? For M1, the source is grounded. For M2, the source is not grounded. It's at a higher voltage than zero. Okay, so then what happens? Does anything change in the transistor? And as it turns out, it does. And this is what happens. So let's assume that to start off, it's in, sub, it's in, it's in uh, inversion. That is, we have enough channel charge. And to, to make matters simple, let's assume that drain and source are of same potential. That is, we are not particularly bothered about saturation and all. So just concentrating on inversion. Uh, and source and body were connected together. And everything was fine. So the electric lines of forces that were coming from gate, right? you have the electric lines of forces that were coming from gate were getting terminated into the, into the channel charge and, and the depletion region that was associated with it. Right? So we had a depletion region associated with this also because it started off with the depletion region to start off. Right? So you had any minus immobile charges sitting all over. Now what happens is when you apply, when you apply a source, when you when you put this source at a higher voltage than body, right? So DSP. When you put this source at a higher voltage than body, then can you comment on the on the uh, uh, on the state of this PN junction around the source and body? Yes, so it gets even more reverse bias, right? So essentially, this depletion region around this increases. Correct? So you have more Na minus charges that are getting uncovered. Not only that, not only that, so what, what is now happening is you are having extra lines of forces electrical lines of forces that are coming from, emanating from the source, which were not there earlier. Now, these extra lines of forces need to terminate, right? 
So it terminates in that extra Na minus, but also you have these freely moving carriers that are under the channel. So some of them will also terminate into these freely moving carriers. In other words, since the carriers are free to move, they will move from channel, some part of it will move from channel and go towards the source, right? The critical thing to note here is that the concentration of the mobile carriers under the channel will decrease because you are pulling some out, right? And that by definition, the threshold, the definition of threshold is there has to be a certain threshold voltages, there has to be a certain amount of concentration, certain concentration of mobile charges in the channel. Now, when you apply an extra source to body voltage, you are reducing the concentration of the mobile electrons from the channel, which means you are going into sub threshold. So in order to restore that threshold, in order to restore that amount of charge, the amount of mobile carriers under the channel, you'll have to apply an extra VGS. You'll have to increase the gate voltage by an extra amount. Okay, note that this is not not similar to the fact that I am increasing source voltage, so I have to increase gate voltage. That anyway you have to do. Because, so for example, you started off with, started off with let's say zero volt on source and let's assume threshold voltage of one volt for the transistor, so the gate was one volt. So if, if this goes to two volt, this goes to one volt, this has to go to two volt. That anyway you have to do. But what I'm saying is that the difference between gate and source has to be increased more than one volt now in order to reach, in order to reach uh, inversion because some part of the mobile electrons got shifted from out of channel. Okay, so threshold voltage will increase. And this threshold voltage has increased because you have applied a voltage between source and body. Okay, so this increase in threshold, so, the conclusion is threshold voltage increases if ESB increases. And this effect is called body effect. And this is, this is important to circuit designers because moment you are affecting the threshold voltage by applying some voltages at the ports, which means that it affects the current current voltage characteristics. It affects how the incremental characteristics will be. It affects everything, right? So that is why it is also important to for circuit designer. And as it turns out, uh, there is a nice closed form closed form solution of this threshold voltage dependence on VBS. I'll not get into the derivation, not a part of this course, but I'll just give you the expression. So the threshold voltage is some threshold voltage in the absence of body effect plus some constant gamma times Don't have to bother about what this pi f gamma is. They are for, for all practical purposes, uh, for circuit designers, they are constants. The important thing is this. Okay, so the threshold voltage will increase if, if uh, I mean the threshold voltage, the fact that threshold voltage is increased, we can argue intuitively how much it will be increasing is dependent on, uh, is, is governed by this equation, right? But ultimately we are interested in designing small signal amplifiers, right? Small signal amplifiers, which means we'll have to figure out what happens if the source voltage changes. Yes. This is for any transistor which whose body is not grounded. Correct. As it, this was a case in point where M2's body will not be grounded. Right. For example, if I if I get another terminal and call it a body, in this case, the body of M1 was connected to the source. In this case, the body of M2 is grounded. Right. Like, uh, and in the below diagram, uh, the LTC and the so the M2 is the case with M2. Yes, is the case with M2, right? So, so now if we go back to our good old 
equation of current i am neglecting this 1 plus lambda vts term because that is not the point of discussion at this moment uh, this vth is essentially this vth right because expression becomes clunky so we simplify it what we do we say that ultimately we are interested in small signal models so what we are interested in to see is that how my gm changes if vsv changes correct for every incremental change in vs how much incremental change in ids that i am having that's what and it's essentially the matter of interest and how do i do what do i do i say i'll do tell ids del vsb or rather del vth sorry i want del vsb right so this i can do partials so the first term becomes and the second term becomes this is constant so i get comma by 2 right so this can be simplified this is gm so minus gamma gm by 200 root 2 phi f plus vsv and we don't like this minus business so what we say is that we will express our uh, expression as minus del id or rather instead of minus we just say del ids del vbs is equal to gamma gm by 2 and we call this gmb where b stands for body okay so uh, how does i mean this is all maths right so i will be given the values of gmb and everything so we don't have to bother about the derivation and all but the key thing that you have to bother about is how does it affect my incremental model right so our incremental model was Gate source train. So this was GM times VGS. This is RDS. What is this telling us? We'll stop in another one minute. So what is what is this telling us? You have a fourth terminal, which is body, and the rate of change of the source to body voltage is affecting my IDS. Correct? So, so whatever is coming out is getting affected by this and what is this telling you is this a resistance it is a transconductance or what so if i if i rewrite this equation this is telling me that del ids is gmb times del vbs it's a transconductance right so in small signal parlance this is i ids is equal to gmb times vbs so how should I modify my uh, my small signal network in order to accommodate for the body effect? Parallel uh, uh, current source, a dependent current source, which comes in parallel to this, and this value of this is GMB times VBS. If body is grounded, if body is grounded and source is grounded, then obviously you see that doesn't exist. In a common source amplifier, that doesn't exist, right? However, if only body is grounded and source is not, then this becomes GMB times VS looking up, right? If B is zero, VB is zero, then this entire thing is becomes GMB VS looking up, okay? So that simplifies our, our calculations uh, greatly. Okay. Okay, fine. Let's stop here. Thank you.